Will astronauts eventually be replaced by robots in space? Is there a plan for a replacement for the Kepler telescope? Do intuitive machines failures mean that Starship HLS is in danger? And in our free bonus question on Patreon, will Artemis become 100% SpaceX? All this and more in this question show. It's time for the question show. Your questions, my answers, as always, wherever you are across my channel, the question pops in your brain. Just write it down. I'll gather them up and I will answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. Marcel de Vogel, will astronauts be replaced by robots? Astronauts have already been replaced by robots. When you think about the work that's being done by the Hubble Space Telescope, by James Webb, by the Curiosity, by uh, various missions around the solar system. You can imagine a version of that done by a human being. You've got a, a human being, like some kind of spacecraft going out to the Earth Sun L2 Lagrange point, And then you've got an, an astronomer sitting in a spacecraft with a, you know, that's a big telescope, and they're looking through the eyepiece in the telescope at at various targets and writing down what they see. So, you know, they've got a robot that's replacing them for that work. And you can even have an astronaut floating around uh, pointing James Webb at different targets, you know, but no a robot does that. Uh, you've got a robot on Mars that is that is digging in into the regolith and examining it and searching for evidence, you've got flying robots. So, you know, I think what I'm getting at um, is that, that, you know, a lot of the times people sort of try to justify what human space exploration is for. And that there are a bunch of things we talk about, you know, keeping our eggs in multiple baskets about becoming a true solar system spanning civilization about about that, that a human being is a far more capable and flexible uh, science machine than any robot and that if you could send a geologist to Mars, they would be able to get a lot more science work done than curiosity or, or perseverance, they can make decisions, they can grab samples, they've got hands, they can bring them back into the lab, they can do all this stuff. But generally, that argument has fallen flat that when you consider the expense and complexity of sending a human to do the job, every single time a robot makes more sense. And so, um, there's, you know, and the and the technology for robots is just increasing. I mean, you're seeing robots that have that have the ability to make very complicated decisions all on their own. Perseverance chose its landing site by itself uh, when it was entering the the Martian atmosphere, and so you're going to see this sort of similar rise. There's miniaturization of various experiments and instruments. And so all of this is just going to keep making robots better, while other forces hopefully are going to drive down the cost of sending humans to space. But but I think and this is my opinion, right? Like now we're going to move into Fraser's opinion mode, um, that that any attempt to justify human space exploration will fail. That you know, if you're gonna say we should send humans because they can be better scientists, that argument doesn't hold water, we're gonna send humans because it's cheaper than sending robots, that argument doesn't hold water, like, and you can go through every single possible reason. Um, and, and in the end, the the one that you're left with is that we send humans because because that's what's next, that that's the next place the humans go, we explore the bottom of the ocean, we go to the tops of mountains, we, we hike into distant forests, we set foot on the moon, and we'll set foot on Mars. And that if you just focus your goal, your goal is not to try to come up with some sort of complicated, justifiable reason to go to space, and you just deal with the simplicity that 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 is the next frontier for humanity, that we need to learn to go to space that we want to go to space that we want to demonstrate that we can go to space that 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 brings out the best of us in our engineering in our in our scientific endeavors that that's reason enough, you know, and so you can have this argument, you can say, well, like, yeah, I think we should have humans set foot on the moon. And someone will go like, why can a robot do it? I'm like, yeah, of course. But that means that a human wouldn't have done it. And so until a human has done it, it's worth doing. Um, and, the, you know, the, the analogy that I always give people is, you know, instead of taking that trip to Europe, you could just send your phone to Europe. And you could have people pick up your phone in Europe, and they could take a short little bit of video and maybe, you know, take your phone to lunch in a French bistro. And then after your phone has made the rounds in Europe, and then you send your phone home, and you get to look through the videos. And you're like, I didn't, you know, I didn't have to go to Europe, I sent a robot to Europe. And you're like, yeah, but 
are you happy with that? Is that what you wanted? So, um, so I think it's going to be the exact same thing, which is that, you know, they're going to be if you want science done, you send a robot, if you want humans to experience everything that being in space has to offer, including the horrible, horrible dangers, you send a person. Arjone, with so many of the lunar landers tipping over, does it make you nervous about starships landing safely on the moon? How do they prepare for this? This isn't something that I had really thought about too much. But now with the two IMs, uh, you know, intuitive machines, two landers, both falling over for like slightly different reasons, but still, uh, that the thing can actually even fall over, that's a concern. And and intuitive machines, Odysseus and Athena, were much more bottom heavy compared to something like Starship. It is a very top heavy rocket. So like, what's the solution? The solution is don't mess it up. Don't land improperly, find a perfectly flat spot that a incredibly top heavy rocket like Starship is going to be able to touch down with the amount of fuel that it has on board and be able to make a safe landing. My guess is the, the solution is they will have mapped the entire landing area with incredible accuracy that they'll keep a lot of propellant in the tank on Starship so that when they do attempt to make that landing, that they will be certain that the landing spot is as safe and as clear as possible. They'll probably re engineer the legs a bit so that they come out a lot more than they do in the, the current I mean, when you look at the current ones, the, the legs are just like tucked underneath the bottom of Starship. Um, like, I don't know how that's gonna you know, not be an issue. So uh, this is, an, you know, and, and so we're just gonna have to wait and watch, we're gonna have to see starships land on the moon safely and not fall over and explode. So that you know that you can do that with astronauts on board. And hopefully there'll be some kind of this, you know, evacuation system. So that if it does land hard, and it is falling over, and it is about to explode, they can evacuate off of the rocket before that actually happens, and then they can get rescued. But yeah, yeah, I mean, it feels kind of like we're all thinking this. So someone's got to solve it. Uh, before I think we should feel confident to put astronauts in that thing. Now, if you missed the full live stream, you can watch it after or you can watch the edited overtime segment on Patreon and it's everything that you didn't get in the published shows. Thanks to everyone who has already subscribed and welcome to our recent newcomers, Robert Thibodeau, Andrew Mitchler, Tommy, Harry Goldstein, Daniel Johansson, David McLean, Jerry Cuckler, Pete S, Brent McLaren and Tim Greaves. Join the club at patreon.com slash universe today. Brian Ibach, what do the cuts in funding mean for Chandra? So when I'm recording this question show, it is March 17th, 2025. And we actually still don't know exactly what the potential cuts to NASA, NSF, NOAA are going to be there have been no specifics provided yet only the uh, fairly confirmed uh, announcement that that cuts are coming that it's going to be a 50% cut to the science directorate. And just to be like super clear, right, that NASA has a bunch of different groups under its umbrella. So there is the human space exploration side of things, there's the aerospace side of things, there's a bunch of other technology sides of things where they help with, um, you know, very spin off technologies, those currently are not part of that science directorate, what the science directorate is, is the missions, James Webb Space Telescope, uh, Hubble Space Telescope, um, Curiosity Rover, and then upcoming stuff, the Titan Dragonfly, Mars Sample Return, um, uh, the all of the missions to Venus. So those and lots of other missions are all under the science directorate. And the, the reporting seems to be that that's going to get a 50% cut. And we and we don't know, we have no idea what how you take 50% off of the budget that do you cut a whole bunch of missions, and then you're left with a, just a couple of missions. And then those missions can continue flying. And then you just, you know, maybe you launch half the missions for the future. Or maybe you cut back the budgets of a whole bunch of missions and dial back the scale and the scope of the missions. But you still try to launch as many missions as you can with a limited budget. And that just means that that the missions will have less instruments or that they will take many more years to develop, because you're only able to spend a little bit of money every year. 
But then you have the maintenance and observation of all the existing missions. So you've got, as you said, Chandra, there is money spent every year on the Voyager spacecraft to keep watch on them to communicate with them to release the scientific data within the community. So, you know, right now, we just don't know, we don't we have no idea what's going to happen. And so I think you should feel anxious about a proposed 50% cut to NASA's science. And, you know, I like I think when you look at the the kinds of things that the administration is saying, they're, um, you know, very interested in reducing any climate science, research, Earth observation stuff. So I think, you know, if you're to look through all the kinds of missions, then I think it wouldn't be unreasonable to say, we're not going to see global warming satellites, we're not going to see measuring Earth sea rise, we're not going to measure global glacier loss, uh, air pollution, methane pollution, you know, those kinds of things, those feel like the natural cuts. But that's not a large chunk of the science director. And so you're kind of left with what you're left with. Um, so right now, we just are in this state of, of uncertainty, which it, you know, like that alone does not make for happy scientists, right? Like anybody, if your boss says, I'm thinking of cutting laying off half of you, but I'm not sure which half, right? That, that, that the incredibly skilled among that group finds a new job immediately. The rest live in in a world of anxiety and fear, trying to figure out what this means for their future. And it does not make for for high performing uh, science and high performing productivity. So uh, and once we have details, I will share them and then we can really consider the consequences of what's gonna happen to missions and stuff going forward. Junied Fayaz, are there any plans for the replacement of the Kepler Space Telescope? So I mean, the Kepler Space Telescope was humanity's great attempt to find an Earth sized world orbiting around a sun like star within the habitable zone uh, of that star. And it was going to be staring at one very specific region of space for years, and slowly watch for all of the transits that were happening in that spot. And then you would see an Earth sized world orbiting you know, would transit in front of a star, and you would see that dip and you'd be like, there's a planet there, okay, let's wait. And then a year later, you would see a planet pass again, you'd be like, okay, I think we found our planet and you wait another year. And you see that third transit and you'd be like, done, we did it, we found it, and you do the math and you're like, yep, that planet is the size of Earth, it's orbiting around a star that's like the sun, and it takes about a year. So it's within the habitable zone of that star, and then all the different flavors and variations of that. That was the dream. And it was launched back in the mid 2000s. And then tragedy struck. And that was that the reaction wheels on the spacecraft failed, and it was left with one reaction wheel. And so it no longer had the ability to point perfectly at the targets that it was attempting to observe. And so NASA had to change its process that they instead of observing specifically this one spot in the sky, they were able to have it observe several different spots of the sky, it was looking at easier targets, red dwarf stars, and the, and the solution is incredible, like that they were able to use the sunlight the pressure, the light pressure coming from the sun to act as a as a reaction wheel. And so they were able to balance against that sunlight to be able to observe uh, these regions, and it gave it years more life. In fact, they only finally shut it down just a couple of years ago. And we're still getting new planets discovered out of that Kepler data. And so like it didn't give us that dream, but it still did a lot of great science. And the problem is that all of the missions, you know, there's a limited amount of budget for missions. And so you you can't duplicate the capability of this mission that had been planned very carefully. You had to make it up. So I mean, there's the the tests, which is a fraction of the size and scale of what Kepler could do that has been finding lots of exoplanets, but probably doesn't have the ability to find the Earth sized world orbiting around the sun like star. But there are some missions that are coming up that could be able to pull this off. And so in the near term, you've got the Plato mission, I've got an interview on the channel all about Plato, but it is another mission designed to search for transiting exoplanets and could very well find an Earth sized world, but it's not like really specialized for that. 
And then you've got ground based observatories that are coming. So the uh, the European extremely large telescope, this is this 39 meter telescope that's going to be in Chile, it's going to get first light in 2028. And this telescope will be capable, for example, of detecting the presence of a Neptune at Proxima Centauri with about an hour of observations. And that it and not like having to watch it be a transit to like just detecting its presence there through the reflected light of of its of the star. And that with about 10 hours of observations, it could probably detect the presence and atmosphere of a planet that's more like the Earth. So that's going to be a really powerful way. Now it's going to work really well for planets that are close by, it's going to have a harder time the farther away you go. And then you're going to have to look to that next generation of planet hunting telescopes. So the habitable worlds observatory, the life telescope, uh, whatever the Chinese have planned, that these will, in addition to be able to observe known exoplanets, they if they don't have targets, then they'll be able to search for planets that meet that criteria. But it's a very slow process that you're looking at one star that seems like a likely candidate to have planets, you're spending dozens, if not hundreds of hours looking in the vicinity for the faint signal of a planet. And if you find it, then you can do deeper observations on that planet. And then you got to move on to the next star and scan that. And it's a laborious process because you got to do them one at a time. And there are 10 million stars within a 1000 light years of Earth. So there's a lot of targets to try and evaluate and they'll only be able to look at a fraction of them. So right now, there is no like none of those missions are approved, except for Plato and the extremely large telescope, but none of those future planet hunting telescopes have been approved. And if there are going to be cuts to science funding, then we could see those be scaled back or just canceled. So right now, no plans to find that other Earth. Did you know you can watch the same video with no ads and get a bonus question over on Patreon completely for free. And this week's bonus question is all about Artemis and SpaceX. Will one subsume the other? I'll put a link in the show notes. All right, thanks for watching. Those are all the questions that we had. Now we record this show live every Monday at 5pm somewhere in the world. And so there's going to be an event for the next recording, which you should be able to find here on the channel. Now I'm going to give you another thing from the shelf. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew Gross, Bradley Groofing, Brian Bowdy, Caridwin, Chuck Hawkins, Commander Balak of the Fasaris, Cy Nelson, David Gilton and David Matz, Dustin Cable, Evan Pro. Greg Feely, Hans Schultz, Hudson Ward, James Clark, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Lawrence Federico, Marcel Smits, Michael Purcell, Paul Robach, Ren Kaidu, Robeck, Sean Sargent, Spidersoft.io, Stephen Fowler Munley, Thomas Hill Skadron, Vlad Chiplin, and Wolfgang Klotz, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. And all our patrons, all your support means the universe to us. All right, time for what's on the shelf. So I got two things here, and I've brought this up in the like in the overtime segment, but I don't think we talked about it in the main show. So I got two things here that are from my mother. And my mother was like, uh, incredible. And uh, she passed away about 13 years ago from Alzheimer's, uh, very young, which you know, is a thing that's haunting my entire family. So um, but she uh, had two things that were very meaningful to her. And so I've incorporated them into my display behind me. The first thing is this, this, this purple thing, you're probably wondering what it is, and it is a crab. Uh, it's a but it's a puppet. Although it's a very, very simple puppet, like all you can do is is mess with its mouth. Um, but it has claws. And this was actually made by a woman on Hornby Island, which is the island that I grew up with, grew up on the west coast of Canada. And so uh, mom always had liked this crab, this stuffed crab, home, homemade by a friend. And so I've got this. And then the other thing is um, a silver urn uh, vase, I think it's for like medicine or something. Uh, there's nothing in it. But uh, this was this was uh, picked up in Shanghai by 
my grandfather, who was an engineer and worked in Shanghai for uh, many years. And he picked up a whole bunch of like really cool artifacts while he was living there, purchased them. He had some embroidered tapestries that used to hang on the wall. We had a junk, which is like a boat, like a miniature version of a boat. Um, but this was the thing that my mother really liked. And so when she passed away, uh, I took these two things from her estate and so and keep them behind me all the time so I can think about my mother. So uh, call your mom. Let her know that you love her. All right, we'll see you next week.